Thank you for joining me, Richard. I'm excited to speak to you. Uh, first, let me introduce you. So Richard is a professor at the Department of Nutritional Sciences at the University of Toronto. He holds the Canada Research Chair in Brain Lipid Metabolism and is the past president of, wait for it, the International Society for the Study of Fatty Acids and Lipids. Okay, got there. Good. His research focuses on the regulation and role of brain lipid metabolism in neurodegenerative diseases and neuropsychiatric disorders. So this is great. Thank you for joining us. Uh, at Vojo, we're dedicated to helping people personalize their diets uh, to achieve health, their health goals in the optimal way for them on a plant-based diet or a more plant-focused diet. So obviously omega-3 fatty acids and all of those are an extremely important topic because you can't get EPA and DHA directly from your diet like you would get them directly from fish. So hot topic for, uh, for plant-based eaters. Uh, but first, let's hear more about you. Tell us about your research. So how did you get interested in fats and brain health in the first place? Uh, thanks, Ellie. I'll dive into this. Good call on the ISFAL. You did that very well. So, you know, I got interested um, in nutrition a long time ago. In high school, a little bit of a, we use the term here, a jock into sports. And then, you know, decided to go to university and wanted to study exercise. And I had assumed incorrectly that you would study exercise and nutrition deg together, right, uh, as a degree. And it turns out they're two separate fields. And literally at the last minute, I uh, elected to do my undergrad nutrition instead of exercise. And, and that's kind of how the story goes. And then got into it in an undergraduate degree, decided to do a master's degree, get a little more focused in, in metabolism and lipid metabolism and a PhD. And then eventually a postdoc where, you know, most people when they think about metabolism are thinking about exercise or running or weight loss, but the brain has a lot of metabolism going on. Uh, so we, you know, worked in that for a bit and then set up my own program on uh, looking at largely omega-3 fatty acids and, and brain metabolism in the context of nutrition and, and brain health. That's, those are my origins. Yeah, you said uh, a brain, like there's a lot of metabolism going on in your brain. I always thought that the brain was actually the most energy intensive organ in your body. Is that true? So, so yeah, so you, you know, you're in, you're in the field, you, you've got a, a handle on this. Um, you, you're absolutely right. And it makes up a ton of our metabolism, especially uh, in infants. But I think a lot of people in the public don't really think about that. They think about their muscles as being metabolism. But your brain's using a, an absolute ton of energy uh, all the time. And it turns out that there's a, a fair amount of lipids, and I assume we're going to get in there, that uh, we're not using for energy, but that we're using to, for our brain cells uh, to talk back and forth to, to each other. Well, we can talk about that now, actually. What, what, what proportion of your brain is uh, fat or lipids? Your brain is almost as fat as your body fat. Um, it's, you know, when we talk about brain composition, we always ignore water, right? Everything's mostly water. So we throw out the water and then your brain is essentially half fat and half protein, which is not far from your adipose or your, the white fat you'd see around your, your hips and your stomach sometimes. Uh, but it's a little different. So the fat in your adipose is saturated, monounsaturated, and it comes in the form of what we call the triacylglyceride or triglycerol. Um, triglycerides, these lots of words for these. And there's kind of three fatty acids stuck to this carbon backbone of glycerol. In the brain, it's mostly phospholipids, which are two fatty acids. Uh, and then they're, they're attached to a glycerol, but with a choline or a serine molecule attached to them. So they're the brain is fat, and it's okay to say somebody has a fat head uh, from, uh, from my perspective, but it's just a little bit different type of fat. And whereas the adipose has these saturates and monounsaturates, the brain gets a little more what we call polyunsaturated, and this is where we're going to get into this DHA but not EPA kind of thing in the brain, and we think that's very important for brain health. So what is all that fat doing in your brain? Why is it that? It's, you know... It's doing everything. If you grabbed a textbook uh, and started looking at, you know, going back into history, people would say, well, it's the neurons in your brain. They need these membranes uh, and they need to be fluid because they, 
they need to pass electrical charges back and forth to each other. And that's true. Uh, and it's, it's very important. But what we're finding, uh, you know, people are starting to appreciate a little bit more is they're, they're actually sending messages in your brain uh, independent of the electrical conductance. So when you're, for example, when your dopamine molecule flies across the synapse and binds to a receptor, one of the things it can do is it can, um, through a second message, release some fatty acids. And those fatty acids get released in response to dopamine and they're doing something. We, we're not exactly sure what they're doing, but they're relaying some sort of message uh, on that side of, of the brain. The other thing is these fatty acids can, we're now realizing, get turned into a lot of other molecules. So you've got your, um, some people, you know, might remember that aspirin works through something called prostaglandin E2 to some extent. Well, it turns out that all of these fatty acids, all these polyunsaturated fatty acids have similar types of pathways that get very complicated. And we're, we're trying to figure out what they do. And if I can oversimplify it a little bit, the, the omega-3s look like they're really important for regulating brain inflammation, uh, you know, the, the brain's it's unique, right? It's got this barrier, it's kind of cut off from the rest of the body. And so it's got its own immune system. And we're starting to see that in the brain anyways, the omega-3s play a pretty important role in help regulating brain immune function. It's really amazing. Like fat uh, has so many different properties and says so many different things, especially in your brain. So it's not just about brain integrity and the brain cells. It's also about messaging. It's about your immune system. It's really pretty much involved in everything. Yeah, the, the, you know, the field has changed dramatically. There's a, a quote in uh, a nutritional, bi or sorry, a biochemistry book about lipids in 1975, Leninger. 1975 is a little significant because <laughs> it was the year I was born. And Leninger yeah. basically says, you know, fat, unlike nucleic acids and proteins, doesn't do anything. <laughs> More or less, it's, you know, you read these books, it's like, it's to keep you warm in the winter. It's uh, to give your body energy, and if you get in an accident, it can insulate you from these things. But it, the field has taken off. There, there was a Nobel Prize given out in 1982 for the signaling uh, from some polyunsaturated fatty acids. And it's, you know, there are so many, so many diverse molecules that are made from this that we're, you know, realizing they, they affected your immune system and, and the body. Now we're seeing it in the brain. As a neuroscientist, we always separate the body and the brain. I, can't explain why, but when I say the body, it means everything but the brain, just the way we do it. And now we're seeing all this going on in the brain, and it's it's really exciting. And it's particularly exciting because it, it can be regulated, at least to a certain extent, by what we eat, uh, which allows humans, you know, to maybe do a little better or unfortunately do a little worse with it, depending on, on how you look at that. Yeah. I mean, there are obviously lots of things you can't control, but there are things you can control, and that's what you eat and what you put inside your body. So nutrition very important as we all know um so you mentioned uh being a neurologist what neurodegenerative diseases or disorders do you work with specifically or what what are you most interested in so so i went and did what's called a postdoc and if your audience isn't always familiar with a postdoc uh, it's uh I shouldn't say this on the record, but it's kind of slave labor. It's after your PhD, you send your parents an email or, you know, a letter or call them and you say, uh, I just got my doctorate. I'm really excited. I'm going to go back to school for a few more years and study a bit more, right? It's this kind of limbo between that and a professorship. And the lab I went to was at the National Institutes of Health, a big U.S. research institute, and they were kind of a math lab looking at the kinetics of how things move in the brain. Uh, and they were interested in, in bipolar disorder. And the reason, you know, I'll make a long story short. In the 1940s, somebody, John Cade, figured out how a drug called lithium, sorry, didn't figure out how it worked, figured that lith, showed that lithium improved symptoms of people with bipolar disorder. Mm -hmm. But he had no idea how, and probably to an extent, we're still not sure how. So this lab was studying if lithium affect brain fat metabolism. And then, so I got into this lab and we started looking at other drugs that were used to treat bipolar disorder. And we were showing that they were affecting, you know, the same sorts of brain fat metabolism. And we came up with a hypothesis called the arachidonic acid. 
that's a hypothesis of bipolar disorder. Hypothesis, it might be right, it might not be, it still needs some more work. But I had come from a nutrition background, and so I had this little, you know, sense like, wait a second, that's nice that these drugs are doing this, that's great, but nutrition can do some of this too. Um, and we can affect these same signaling pathways, you know, not as robustly with nutrition, but you can do it over a longer period of time. You can do it before you get the disorder. And then we started, you know, the field started to open up a little bit because um, Alzheimer's disease, the inflammatory hypotheses around Alzheimer's disease started to open up and the epidemiology started to show that people who didn't eat fish or didn't eat omega-3s were at increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. So we, you know, I, I went from a bipolar dis disorder uh, field to getting interested in Alzheimer's disease. And while that was happening, an emerging literature in major depression started to uh, show up. And that people with major depression, if they took fish oil supplements, and maybe we should get into this a little bit more later, that are high in EPA, which is another omega-3, but not DHA, it seems to work a little bit uh, in them. So we've been kind of playing around in, in those disorders over over the past few years uh, as a focus. You mentioned um, basically preventative nutrition, like doing these things earlier on because, you know, over a longer period of time, nutritional changes, they t just take more time than taking medication and it's less targeted. But I guess the problem we have is that uh, our healthcare systems aren't set up to be preventative most of the time and people only start thinking about these things once they start seeing the signs and they start getting scared of uh, whatever like diseases they might be they might be developing so yeah this is a this is a bit of a problem uh, I think how how do you think we can deal with that so you're kind. You say it's a bit of a problem. It's a huge problem, right? Um, you know, Alzheimer's disease, when the symptoms show up, there's uh, portions of brain cells that have died and are gone. The idea that you're going to eat a healthy diet at that point and regrow those cells, it's off the table to me. I, I think it's impossible. Uh, we we got to get at this earlier. And, you know, this is a big uh, public health issue. So it's a little out of my expertise. How do you get people to do that? What I hope to do is to show the proof of concept and the mechanisms and, and you know, like, you know, this really works and get my public health friends really excited about it. Uh, and that way they can go on and, and show the public like, wow, look at this exciting data we have. We need to do this. And then maybe eventually we can develop policies or food supplies or food programs uh, you know, at the national, international level that can kind of guide these things. So I've, I've done a little work with the WHO in the past and, you know, we're, we're starting to get this going. To some extent, we need a little bit of better evidence, which takes a long time in nutrition. You know, people don't think about this, but how would you, you know, if you're, if you're just sitting at home right now listening to this and I said, you want to do a study in Alzheimer's disease in people, we want to give some people a good diet and some people would call it the normal diet which maybe is a bad diet right and then how many people would you have to do this for and then when would you give it to them would you give it to them when they're 60 years old or would you give it to them when they're 30 years old and let's say you say 30 because you want to prevent this you really want to prevent this well then how long do you have to wait uh to get this answer right you you, you have to have them on the diet for 60 years and so, you know, these things are going to take time to, to get the kind of evidence I think that people would really like to see. But if we can figure out the mechanisms and we can do a variety of types of studies and, and you know, get people a little bit excited about it, maybe they'll take the initiative into their own hands. That being said, if you look at the obesity epidemic uh, and a lot of the nutrition, um, you know, intakes of, uh, coming out around the world, I'm a little skeptical, or at least I'm not sure we're doing this right at the moment. It's going to be a tough job. I really like that you have a strategy, though. Like, you've thought this through. You know what your strategy is. And even though you know it's going to be a long haul, you know what you're doing. And that's really, really cool. But yeah. And, and this is where, you know, science, we use a variety of approaches. We use randomized controlled trials. We use observational studies, sometimes called epidemiology. We use preclinical studies and mechanistic studies. And, you know, if we can get some good evidence, 
and find something that's hot. I think, I think people will listen. I think people are interested in brain health. I think they've seen, you know, uh, family and friends develop Alzheimer's disease and, you know, they, anything we can do to, to, you know, change the trajectory of that disorder would be important. Yeah, no, I totally agree. And it's it's funny with nutritional research or health research, uh, we always have the problem where people are like, but it's not a randomized controlled trial, like it's just a mechanistic study or whatever, but it all adds to the evidence. And sometimes we always need to start there, but you know that can inform a lot as well. We don't always need these um, really big studies straight away one because they take a lot of time they're expensive and two, like you've mentioned and two because you need those initial studies anyway to be able to start these huge studies absolutely you know the observational studies show us that patterns of people who develop alzheimer's disease versus don't are quite strong you know the dietary patterns and sure, they're confounded by exercise, being bilingual, knowing music, all these things. And at one aspect, people would look at that and say, oh, that's confounded. It's complicated. I don't understand it. I wake up in the morning saying, I want to play with that. You know, I want to I want to try and dissect little parts of this and see what's plausible and, and what's not plausible. It's, it's, an, it's a re you know, confusion is a research opportunity. You just got to be patient and and, you know, try and. Uh, come up with some new ideas and hire some good people to, to work on these things uh, going forward. And then you're absolutely right. Once we, we know what we're doing to some extent, then we can do the better quality studies in the right populations for the right period of times, looking at the right things. You know, people are now developing imaging techniques to see the, you know, the early signs of Alzheimer's disease. So maybe we could use that as an endpoint in a study now instead of, you know, Alzheimer's disease itself. And, and some of these things are going to work and some of them are not. But, but as, you know, as these new things jump out, we want to we want to have the technologies and the ideas ready to be able to test them. I'm very glad that we have scientists like you. That's for sure. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, You're welcome. We've already got a bit of peace. But anyway, that's that's what the fun part is. Um, let's go back to, uh, to omega-3. So can you explain to us the difference between ALA, EPA, DHA, DPA? There's all these types of omega-3. What are they all and how are they connected? Sure. So there, there's even a lot more than that, but the big three are ALA, um, EPA, and DHA. So we're going to start with ALA. It stands for alpha linolenic acid. And this is great because it's not alpha linoleic acid. And some people probably didn't even hear that difference. Linoleic, linolenic. The, the naming's awful, okay? And that's why we call it ALA. So we don't trip ourselves up when we're talking uh, in public. But ALA is uh, what we call a plant-based omega-3 sometimes. And it's not, it's not to say it's only in plants, it's in other things. And it's important because it has... Um, these omega-3s are made up of carbon atoms, and there's 18 of them in ALA. And it's an omega-3. ALA gets really confusing here. It has three double bonds, but that's not why it's an omega-3, okay? Uh, that's the connections between the carbons. The last position of a double bond is three away from the end of the molecule, and that's why it's called an omega-3. You eat that in plants. You know, in, in Canada, we talk about flaxseed being a great source of ALA. Um, and, you know, now we've got chia seeds. I don't know the big ones in, in Germany. Uh, I think it's the same everywhere. Chia and flaxseeds, they're, they're the ones. Okay. But in reality, not everybody eats chia and flaxseeds. So the big dietary sources in Canada are, uh, are things like soybean oil, or we have canola oil, uh, which has a lot of omega-3s in it, at least currently in Canada, and then green leafy vegetables. So although we talk about flaxseed and chia and some of these things, the, which are, have a ton of it, just because not a lot of people eat them, we're getting them from the other sources. And then we've got these two that we sometimes call fish oils. And I'm using those quotes um, because they're predominantly found in fish, but there's exceptions to all of this stuff. Okay. Um, and EPA stands for eicosapentaenoic acid. And if people are really good with languages, they'll recognize that the word eco means 20 and penta means five. So we went from 
something that was 18 carbons with three double bonds to something that is now 20 carbons eco with penta five double bonds. And it's still an omega-3 because the omega-3 comes not with the number of novel, double bonds, but the position towards the end of the molecule. EPA is classically found in fish oils and is very low in the brain, uh, as long with its precursor ALA. And then we've got DHA, DOCO, 22, uh, HEXA, 6. So 22 carbons long, 6 double bonds, DHA we call it. And that one is also found in fish, and that one is also found in the brain. And that's where, you know, people, if you've probably heard your parents or somewhere say that uh, fish is brain food, and it's literally because of that molecule DHA, which is high in the brain, is also high in fish. So a long time ago, before we even have any evidence, people were, were making that connection. Now, you, we can eat those foods. You can eat the plants to get your ALA and the fish to get your EPA and DHA, but our body can also do something that predominantly happens in our liver. Our liver can take the ALA and elongate it, so add some carbons to make it 20 or 22, or and or it can desaturate it. And that's just a funny term for putting more double bonds. So we can make EPA and DHA from ALA. The controversy for a long time is how well can we do it? How much can we do it? And I assume we're going to go down that, that path in the near future here. So I'll stop there for now. We're definitely going down that path, that's for sure. Um, Quick side note, how often do you say all of the names out like with their proper, proper full names? Yeah, that's a good, so I, you know, when I see them in my head, I actually see um, it, it very differently. It's kind of funny. So I don't even say ALA. I see 18-3-N-3, which is another chemical <laughs> way of writing them. So it's a, it's a whole other thing because I'm trying to fit them into pathways. Uh, I rarely say, we rarely say them out loud. You have to write them, you know, in the paper to define them. Uh, but yeah, you, you don't say them that much. And it's interesting because I'll, I'll hear people all the time call ALA linoleic acid, which is really a good trip up because linoleic acid, just to make things worse, is the name of an omega-6 fat. <clears throat> that has nothing to do with omega-3. So you got people standing there saying, you need to eat more linoleic acid from flaxseed and this and that. And you're like, no, 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 linoleics and corn and these other things. And, it, you know, it actually competes with the other one. So it's a bit tricky. So we try and use these acronyms to, to keep it straight and, and organized. But sometimes I worry that these complicated naming things are just ways to keep people out of the field and, and let us experts run around with nobody questioning us because people can't get the nomenclature down. That's a great point, actually. But mm. we have the acronyms, so we're all safe. It's fine. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, so you have studied the conversion. You briefly mentioned this, but you've studied the conversion between EPA and DHA um, and also ALA. So in one of your studies, you found that giving people an EPA supplement increased their EPA levels, but not their DHA levels. Whereas on the other hand, giving people a DHA supplement increased their EPA levels and DHA levels. Okay, so tell us in broad terms, what's going on here? Okay, I'm going to back up one step. <clears throat> ALA usually goes to EPA and then EPA goes to DHA. So ALA can get to DHA, but it's got to go through EPA. And there are other steps. We won't get into those. <clears throat> Everybody says, and this is going to be important, that the conversion of ALA to DHA is low. People say that the conversion of EPA to DHA is low. They use numbers like 1% or something like this. There's all kinds of numbers, but they're low. Why are the numbers low? Because 1% is low. If, if if I give you $100 and you give me a dollar back, that's a low conversion, right? That, that's not good. It's a low number. But in reality, I think what we've missed in the field is we shouldn't worry about the 1%. We have to ask ourselves, how much do we need? And if I only have to buy a piece of gum, I might be able to do it with that dollar you've just given me. Okay, so that's, I want people to start thinking about this because I'm going to throw some switches later. <clears throat> the other thing people have shown is when you feed a ALA, ALA goes up, but DHA doesn't go up in your blood. So if you eat a ton of ALA, ton of flax, your blood ALA levels will go up, but your DHA levels won't. 
And so people say, well, that's because it's not being converted. That's that little conversion. Sure, let's, let's give them that. The next one is if you give EPA, so if I gave you a pure EPA supplement, grams and grams of it, and you took it for days and days and days, your DHA won't go up. And they'll say, aha, that's because EPA also isn't converted to DHA. So what we did is a little complicated, but we used uh, a technique called mass spectrometry, a new type of, not a new type, we, an old type of mass spectrometry, but we put a twist in it. And what we can do is because EPA is made up of carbons, it turns out that a small amount of carbons in the food supply sometimes weigh a little bit more than others, okay? Just carbon usually weighs 12, but 1% usually weighs 13. But we got a little source of EPA that, if I can make this a little simple, was a little heavier. And then we gave this EPA to subjects for, for weeks and weeks, and then we measured the DHA. And the DHA didn't go up, and people are like, aha, we told you, you gave all this EPA to these people for ages, and DHA didn't go up. But what we saw was that the DHA was heavier now. It was the same weight as the EPA. And the explanation for that, without getting too complicated into isotopes, is because the EPA got converted to DHA. In fact, all the DHA in the subject's blood had come from EPA, but the DHA levels weren't going up. And that's explained by something called turnover. When something goes up in your blood, there's kind of two reasons for it. You either make more or use less. And people always think about make more, they never think about use less. What we were able to show is that EPA readily turned into DHA, even though it didn't increase DHA levels. Uh, and so we published that, it was in humans. Uh, we had done preclinical work to support this. And I was like, wow, that's interesting because that challenged a lot of assumptions, right? Because people are saying you, you eat EPA, DHA doesn't go up, there's no conversion. We're saying, yeah, you're right, it doesn't go up, but there's a ton of conversion. And now the big question, which I don't have the answer for, but obviously this is what I want to do and we're hoping to do is, is the same thing true for ALA? <clears throat> Does ALA get converted straight through to DHA uh, and, you know, rapidly replace all the DHA, but just not increase the DHA levels? And I don't know the answer to that, but our working hypothesis is yes, uh, it's going to behave the same as the EPA. That's really exciting. I mean, you're going to be having plant-based people on the edge of their seats here. <laughs> when is when are you yeah. doing this research? <laughs> well, so so um, it's complicated. We, we we got some funding, so we're we're ramping it up. Um, as as everybody on the planet knows, we had a pandemic, or we still have one, which makes human research a little tricky at the moment. So we're delayed, uh, but but we're ramping up. Uh, and you know, I just hired a. New, well, in September, I think I'm hiring a new PhD student to get this project going. And while we're doing that, we're calling up all our friends saying, look at our paper, look at our paper. Do you have samples in a freezer uh, from a study where you gave ALA that this might work and we might be able to do what I would call a secondary analysis of somebody else's study to get a hint? And hopefully we'll have some hints by early next year. We're, we're starting to get those samples being shipped to us from other studies and we're gonna start analyzing them over the next few months. Uh, so not yet, but soon. Okay, I have a lot of questions. Um, with this new research, uh, is genetic something you're gonna take into account? Absolutely. Uh, we're gonna take into account genetics because there's, there's differences in those enzymes that put the carbons on and put the double bonds, on, double bonds in. We're starting to see it a little bit. <clears throat> There's, you know, there is evidence in the literature that depend, some people can be what we call fast converters or slow converters. So we need to take this into account for. We also need to study sex. And when we say sex, I mean males and females um, because it's, it's the year 2021 and we have to stop doing studies in males. It's silly. <clears throat> it, it just absolutely is. And there's evidence that females uh, might be a little better at this conversion than males and we want to check this out in our own hands as well and you know you can look at this data and maybe there are people <clears throat> that are going to be really good at this uh, and they can take the plant source and just do this quite well and, and then maybe there's going to be people that it's going to be a little trickier for uh, the problem with nutrition, right, is you never know if something's high and low or low and high. 
it's always tricky that way. So <clears throat> we're going to definitely take these uh, factors into account in our studies. But I missed something. Um, I missed the DHA going to EPA in your last question, if I can come back to that for a second. Yeah, sure. Because I'm, <clears throat> I'm really excited about this. And I might be completely wrong, which makes it even more exciting. DHA, they use this term called retroconversion. So I always said ALA goes to EPA to DHA. A couple of people who know this field say, well, 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 wait a second. There's also DHA can go to EPA, and that's called retroconversion or back conversion. We're finding that that's, I won't say not true, it happens, but it's not really what's going on. When you give DHA, EPA levels go up. So people are always saying that's because DHA is being retroconverted to EPA. We're finding it's not. We're finding that it's the DHA stopping the metabolism of EPA. And it's like, wait a second. So you stop the metabolism of EPA and then EPA levels go up. So what we're excited about is we want to find how much DHA you need to eat to start stopping the EPA metabolism. Where am I going with this? It's DHA is stopping EPA from becoming DHA. Let's say that again. DHA is stopping EPA from making DHA. Why? I think, I hypothesize, I might be wrong, that this is DHA's way of regulating its own levels. There's enough of me we need to stop making me. And I think that is going to be a marker of DHA requirements in humans. The level of DHA intake at which you stop making DHA from this pathway that we have conserved in us might be a signal to say there's enough here. Let's stop this pathway and do something else with these molecules. That's something we also have funding for, and we need to figure out the exact mechanism which we're working on, and we need to figure out the dose in humans which that happens. And, you know, we'll keep thinking about this, but that's my hypothesis. We might be able to find out how much DHA we need. And then this gets important because if you eat, Ellie, do you know how many grams of ALA you eat a day? You probably know. Yeah, I eat about one and a half tablespoons of chia or flax seeds per day. So about three grams. Okay, so you're, you're on the high end, okay? But let's pretend, it, so most people in Canada eat probably just, just over a gram. And I'll use a gram just to keep the math simple, okay? A gram is a thousand milligrams. And so people say, oh, but you can only convert 1%. You can only convert 1%. So if you can only convert 1% of 1,000, that's 10 milligrams you can make. If you, don't, if you only need 4 milligrams of DHA, that could be enough, right? And this, this low conversion, who cares, right? Because it's the wrong angle to take on it. And so we need to test doses of DHA that stop its synthesis. And if we find that the you know, you're eating more than, than that level we come up with, you're, you're kind of fine uh, going through that. And then, it, you know, the 1% is actually a very complicated number. I'm just using a, a standard number in the field. So we're, we're really excited that we might be able to make a bio, take a biochemical approach to studying how much DHA we need and putting this all back together. That's really cool because it's so much more accurate, or it could be. Uh, but yeah, the one percent number that that is more complex than it seems because that's that's an average of everyone that's you know in these studies, right? So there it's, are it, going to be individual differences going on there. There's going to be individual differences. It's also a lot more complicated than that. So one of the fun things I got to do in my postdoc, my supervisor was a bit of a math guy, um, uh, and we were into kinetics and mathematical modeling. And the 1% number is really complicated uh, for the reasons you said it varies uh, and varies by genetics and a bunch of things, but it's also really tricky because the way they do these studies is they give people a, a tracer, one of these labeled ALAs, and then they wait and they find some level of DHA from the tracer in the blood and they do like okay, well, I gave you this much and what's the percentage in your blood and correct for how much blood volume and you like, okay, and you come up with 1%. It's a good approach. I, I think it was a good start, but it's not a synthesis rate, 
It's not a rate. A percentage isn't a rate. Um, and we were developing methods to try this in humans to calculate rates. It's hard. You, you got to get into what's called steady state where you have to infuse humans. And it's only the blood, right? It's the amount in your blood. What about your liver? What about this? And most of that ALA you eat goes to your adipose tissue, your body fat, the tracer. And why would you do that? I'm going to go off on a tangent here and I'm going to let you know my hypothesis. I think you've put it in your body fat for a rainy day and you store it and you store it forever. And then when you need it, you release it and it goes to your liver and it makes some DHA and it goes to your brain. And we've estimated with the current numbers in the literature that the DHA you're making right now, Ellie, if, if you're making some, you might have had last year at lunchtime. You can store it in your body fat for a year and then release it. So these tracer studies are missing that. And there's some, you know, if you put a, if you put a, uh, if you, I don't think the 1% is an accurate estimate. Let's just say that. I think there's some, some things being missed in that number that we're trying to get around to. So you'd want to measure the, the omega-3 levels in your, um, in your fat tissue as well. But what about your brain? Like if you're measuring the DHA levels in your blood cells, what about all the DHA in your brain? How do you take that into account? I have no idea. And neither does anybody else. You, you, you hit a research question, okay? And, and that's really important because maybe from a, you know, if, if my friends are studying heart disease, might jump up right now and say, no, 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 no. But, but from the brain's perspective, we don't know that answer. I'll tell you this though, my friends at the NIH did a fascinating study in just a handful of subjects, okay? And they made a special tracer DHA and they infused it into a handful of young males in Bethesda, Maryland. Uh, and they eventually they did a few more subjects and they measured the speed, the rate of which DHA entered the human brain using a, a technique called PET where they're imagers, okay? And they were able to do math and quantify how many milligrams of DHA the brain uptakes uh, in adult humans. You want to take a guess? Do you mind if I put you on the spot? How many milligrams of DHA goes into the human brain? Uh, I have no idea. None. Four. Tell me. They got, they got four milligrams. Wow. Four milligrams, not grams, milligrams. So let's go back to our numbers, right? You eat 3,000 a day, about. People say you can convert 1% of that. I think the 1%'s got a lot of issues and I wouldn't do this, but this is a napkin calculation. That means you're making 30 a day on average. That's more than four, right? 30 is more than four. Is it enough? Well, you know, we need to do some more research on that, but it's quite a bit more than four. I think it's probably more than 30 too. Uh, and, you know, you got the rest of the body, but this is the kind of, you know, napkin calculations we're doing and we're trying to develop more methods for. Um, is it enough for the brain? Uh, hypotheses and other sources of data would suggest that in adults, we can talk about kids if you want, and all my assumptions, let me put this right out here, change during neurodevelopment. Uh, neurodevelopment's come, you and I have grown brains. They're not growing. Sadly, they're not getting any bigger. And we use a little bit of DHA and we replace it. So we use for all that signaling we were talking about, right, earlier. DHA gets consumed in these metabolic reactions in the brain, four milligrams a day, we think. And then four milligrams comes in and replaces it. A child, an infant, has to grow a brain, which is a very different story. But these are, these are the kind of new modeling or new arithmetic we're putting into this, this, these big questions. This is all super interesting. Like we have such a simplified view uh, of this and it's kind of surprising that we haven't delved more into this research sooner, actually. But so we're talking about brain turnover of DHA. Like obviously some people are going to have a higher turnover of omega-3s in their brain, right? Like there's genes which predispose people to Alzheimer's disease and studies have shown that these people may have a higher turnover of DHA in their brain. So would it mean that those people need more? Or if you can only incorporate so much into your brain at a time, like, does that mean it doesn't make any difference? Like, what, what's going on there? 
So, so there's a problem with the question you've hit me with. You, that's the same question I have, and I don't know the answer. Uh, and I phrased it that way. When I kind of said a handful of young males in Bethesda because that's the data we've got. And there, there's a little bit more than that. I, I don't want to make it too simple. But these are big questions. This is what we have to answer. Are there people that have a higher turnover of DHA for genetic reasons, brain inflammation, Alzheimer's hypotheses, you know, brain disorders, uh, psychiatric disorders? Yes or no? Uh, if the answer is yes, can we um, supply them more DHA therapeutically through diet, however? And does that matter? Does that make a difference in the disease outcome? I think your listeners are going to be a little disappointed pointed, but that's the state of the art right now. Those are the big questions. Those, that's what I want to get funding to, to study. Uh, and, and some people, you know, there are hypotheses and there is data supporting exactly what you said, but we, we got to figure that out a little bit better. But it's complicated. And I want to come back to major depression just for an example of this, okay? If you look at the, the literature where they've given fish oil supplements in people with major depression versus a placebo, and they've went back and kind of analyzed the studies after they've been done and put them in what we call meta-analyses. They suggest that EPA and not DHA is better at treating the symptoms of major depression. In fact, some people say DHA doesn't work and some people will say DHA is so bad that it impairs EPA's ability to work, okay? A little bit of controversy, I'm just stating the controversy. And that's wild because EPA is barely detectable in the human brain. The brain has, people will say the brain has omega-3s, eh, little misleading. It's got DHA, it's got none of the others, almost none of the others. So why is that? Well, we were able to show uh, preclinically that EPA and DHA get into the brain at the same speed, but that the EPA is consumed, it's destroyed almost instantly upon entering the brain. I say destroyed. It's probably being converted into a lot of these important signaling molecules. So I just want to let your, your, your viewers know this is a little complicated and we're, we're a little confused here, right? Because we get, in some cases, EPA doing things even though it's barely present in the brain. And remember, we just had a conversation about DHA stopping EPA metabolism. So we got a few moving parts. We got different disorders, and we got all the questions you have. Do people have different brain DHA turnovers la yeah, uh, than others, and does that matter? And that's the research that we're we're diving into right now. And does does it matter ultimately? It's crazy how misleading some studies can be. Like you think that when you're reading a scientific study, that you're going to get good information from it, but if their methodologies aren't quite right or is that there are things that you don't know yet and it the, some of these results are just misleading and then you add in the fact that the media are then reporting on these studies uh, and then simplifying it even more or taking a twist how do you feel about the current state of the public knowledge about this this area so i i'm concerned and and you know your readers should take listeners or readers, I don't know what we call these video podcasts anymore, uh, times of change, should take everything I say with a grain of salt and challenge it. And that's the way science should be, right? Don't, don't believe a word I'm saying. Go look at the research. You know, if you're serious about this, take your time and do it and challenge me, send me an email. And some of my colleagues disagree with me. I just want to say that out there. You know, we're not, uh, you know, this isn't clear. And some people, there are technical details in here. But I think, you know, we're working, we're moving methods forward and going forward. With the pandemic, if I can use that as an analogy, I'm extremely concerned about um, uh, the level of scientific understanding in the public and the level of misinformation in the public. Um, you know, we all started working from home a little bit more. Maybe we spent a little bit more time on social media and on looking at things. And I saw the craziest stuff I've ever seen in my life. Just crazy stuff. And people believe it. And then when you say, do you have any evidence for it? They turn around and say, you're just part of the scientific something and you're bought and paid for because you get grant money and you used to work at the NIH. So, you know, Fauci. So, so you must be an evil person. Like it's bad. And, and that's the one extreme end. Um, at a more moderate level, I think there's a lot of confusion and there's a lot of pushing and pulling of, of people with different ideas and different resources. And 
if I'm to criticize the media, it's like every time a study comes out, it doesn't matter if it's the 30th time it's been done or it's the first study to show something that 20 others didn't, they, it's always new, right? It's like, eat this, cures that, eat, don't eat that, causes that, blah, blah, blah. And, and I think it's a really tough, uh, a really tough thing. I try and work with the media. We're doing this to some extent. You're part of the media, right? This kind of form and, but it's tricky and, and it's not my expertise, but uh, it's it's really complicated. And I think it, if you want to be serious about it, unfortunately, it takes a fair amount of time to, to understand these things. Yeah, you do a really, really good job of um, explaining your research and what's going on, though, in, in terms that we can understand. So uh, thank you very much. Some like I well, feel like some scientists are, are very much using a lot of terminology and words that many people well, wouldn't understand so thank you but it, but it's important you, you, you people listening to this anytime i find you distill something down which you have to do right mm -hmm. you lose a little bit of the nuance so so you know i'm talking about some of these things and if one of my colleagues was listening they say well that's not quite right there's a you skipped a step there right and that next step's important and we do this in these kinds of conversations but so if if Sadly, if you want to take this seriously, you've got to grab those papers and you've got to read them. And then, unfortunately, lots of people won't be able to do that because you're going to have to read a bit about mass spectrometry before you can read our paper. And you're going to have to read a little bit about kinetics before you read our paper. And, and I, think it's, I think it's hard. It's just hard to do. So I can poke at the media a little bit, uh, but um, I'm happy I'm not doing that job because I'd be the one getting poked at, I think. It is difficult, like when you're talking about the methods as well that you use, like like mass spectrometry. Yeah, a lot of people who are nutritionists or, or dietitians or whatever, they won't have knowledge about these methodologies. Like I, I have the benefit of my bachelor's in chemistry, so I worked with GCMS, so I understand these methods, but a lot of people don't. So even people in the in that realm, in the nutrition realm, maybe don't understand these methodologies. So, yeah, it's. Uh, you, you know. It's an amazing time for nutritional sciences. I think it's a really exciting time because we're, we're you know, you can, if you look at people my department hires, some of them aren't coming straight out of nutrition. Some of them are coming straight out of epidemiology. Some of them are coming out of molecular biology. And now we're using all these tools and all these different approaches to study these questions. And I, th I think it's an exciting time. I think we're going to make some discoveries. We're going to clarify some controversial questions by using a variety of these approaches. But the, the traditional path to being a nutritional scientist, I think, has changed. You know, my postdoc was in the uh, brain physiology and metabolism section, not a nutrition section, right? And so people come into these things with... Uh, you know, you, you come into a different field with a different set of tools and you're like, hey, I, I have a different approach to this question. I like kinetics and I'm, you know, I'm not so interested in present conversions. So I'm trying to calculate rates. And, you know, sometimes you get the same answer as other people and sometimes you don't. And when you don't, then you got to sit down and say why. So I, I think there's a lot going on here. It's super exciting. As you said, everyone's coming from different areas. Uh, there must be loads of uh, research opportunities or just ways that you haven't thought of doing things before just because people are from a different field yeah so uh, absolutely and one of the things we're excited about is you know we're using a different type of mass spectrometry it's called isotope ratio mass spectrometry and we're using it at what's called the natural abundance level and that if people can remember way back somewhere they learned about a c3 plant or a c4 plant and they they you know allow foods to have different weights and carbon and it turns out uh you, you'll like this uh corn is uh high in carbon 13 it's it's got a heavier carbon content if i can use this simple language again the word any mass spectrometer just listening to me right now saying that is the worst analogy but it's, it's heavier right the um, and it's amazing because you're probably very well aware of algal DHA sources for, for people who want to use plant-based DHA. Guess what they feed algae as a sugar source? Yes. <laughs> High fructose corn syrup, right? So, uh -huh. so if you, uh, it depends where you are. Actually, in Germany, I think sometimes you guys use uh, beetroot sugar to feed algae. So, but if I get algal DHA from the US, 
they feed it high fructose corn syrup. What does that mean? That means that that DHA molecule is heavier. My American or North American DHA is heavier than your German DHA, if I can say that. And that allows me to study it because I can give you the one and see the differences in your blood because it doesn't look like the natural form you have in your blood. Conversely, if you're an American or North American or Canadian, I'm from Canada, but this stuff's only in the US, I could take your German DHA off the shelf and do the study in Americans to, to see how it changes their blood levels. So there's, there's a lot of exciting uh, opportunities coming out because of these new methods uh, that I actually learned about from ecologists uh, who were kind of saying to me, you do all this omega-3 research, you know, the oceans are going to, you know, deplete of fish and, the, the, you know, all these environmental issues. So maybe you should think about these things a little bit more. And we use this technique and I started scratching my head and I said, wow, that's interesting. And then we got access to one of these machines. And right now we're building one in our lab uh, today, literally today. Uh, we've been at it for a few weeks and I hope it'll be ready in within a month to start running our own samples on. This is so cool. This is really, really cool. So these heavier uh, carbons in the DHA, they don't affect us necessarily. So they don't affect how the DHA works or our health or anything like that. But it means that you can take sources from different countries and then test how it gets incorporated into people from other populations where the carbon isotopes are different. Absolutely. It means Great. if I can find an ALA source that's heavier than what you're currently eating or lighter, then I can look at the DHA and say, hey, where did you come from? Are you heavier now that I gave you the heavier or are you lighter that I gave you the lighter? And if you do this over time and with the right parameters and know how much, then I can say how much you made. How much of this DHA did you make from the ALA? Uh, and that's kind of how we got to this idea that this retro conversion wasn't retro conversion because let's keep it simple. We gave a heavy DHA and the EPA went up, but it wasn't a heavy EPA. And if, if the EPA was coming from DHA, it should have been heavy, but it wasn't. It was, it actually looked like it was coming from ALA. So that's when we, we put the idea forward that it was stopping the metabolism going forward. So, you know, you get a new tool from a new field with a handful of friends, and, and now we can start to maybe answer some questions uh, that we didn't really have the, the right tools to do before. This is great. So we have talked a lot <laughs> about DHA, EPA, omega-3, the brain, everything today. But what are some things that people can actually do? So individuals at home, what is your advice to them in general? So, you know, I'm not a dietitian, uh, and I phrase that, you know, I think it's important people realize that. But my take on, you know, one of the big issues I have, and people jump at me for this one, is they say, this is complicated. I'm just going to take a supplement. Okay. Uh, th that's, you got a point. That's a point. It's complicated. Let's just take a supplement. Let's not worry about the details. I worry, though, that that enables bad eating, that approach that, you know, I take a fish oil supplement, I can go to this fast food restaurant because I take a fish oil supplement, I take a multivitamin, I don't have to worry about what I eat because I take a multivitamin. I don't think that's the right approach. I think, unfortunately, it's hard. And it's complicated. And the best evidence we have points to eating a good diet, so you don't have to worry about capturing these things at the end. And it's more complicated than we talked about here because that linoleic linolenic, there's a lot of evidence that that linolenic, which people eat a lot of, impairs our ability to make DHA. So we talked about, you know, maybe females are better at than males. So I'm going to use the worst case scenario, males. And then maybe I have the genes that make me a low synthesizer. And then maybe I eat a lot of this omega-6 and it's like, well, wait a second. So now I've got three, you know, checks against me in terms of my ability to do this. And when people say, well, I've got three checks or I don't know how many checks, so I'm just going to take a fish oil supplement. My advice would be don't do that. Um, clean up the things that you've got going wrong. And I suspect if you do that, a handful of things will, will start pointing in, in better directions. If I'm wrong, well, then we need to know that and maybe we need to have 
precision nutrition recommendations where these people do need uh, a certain amount of DHA in their diet uh, as a requirement, and these people don't. And public health wise, we're not quite there, but this is a big topic going on right now, right? Uh, do we have enough evidence to make individual recommendations for nutrition and not population ones? It's a, it's a big controversial topic, but I I kind of see it as as a you know, don't keep putting band-aids on the problem over and over again. Let's let's get to the problem. Let's eat healthier diets because I think when you do that, you're going to find that a bunch of things uh, improve and go in the right direction, especially in the long term. I totally agree with you. It's diet first always, and yeah, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of push for supplements in the industry because you know it's an industry, but diet first takes a bit more effort. But you're right if you just rely on supplements. There's a party that's like, well, you know, don't have to think about well, this from my diet anymore. Well, what if I'm, what if we're wrong, right? Or, and I see my colleagues are wrong. And, and when you look at, if I can just use fish and Alzheimer's disease as an example, we have observational studies where people eat fish in, they have less incidence of Alzheimer's disease. So some people say, oh, it's because of the omega-3s. Therefore, we should, we should just take them. Okay. Well, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Fish, unfortunately, is expensive. That means people who eat a bit more fish tend to have a bit more money. That takes you down a spiral of confounding factors from education to you know socioeconomic status. It's unbelievably complicated and could explain all this. But then it gets even more interesting. There's some people who say, well, fish is a good source of protein, so maybe it's the protein, not the fish. Then you've got people say, well, how do you eat fish? You have it with a glass of white wine, which is good for your health. I think it's a little controversial. And you sprinkle lemon on fish, which is a source of antioxidants. So the antioxidants, people are like, it's not the fish, it's the antioxidants. And then my favorite kind of weird hypothesis is that when you're eating fish, you're not eating junk food. Uh, you're displacing another meal. And so, you know, we're, we're talking about fish and if you go to different fields, people extrapolate this every which way, right? So the economists are like, it's, it's a money factor and the antioxidants people are like, it's this lemon oil you squeeze on uh, lemon juice on the fish and all these things. And, and I'm open to the idea right now that we're not a hundred percent sure what the mechanism is, but so if you take a supplement or you do these things, you might be missing things. But the point is, if you eat the fish or the whole food, then you get the effect. And I think it's this, you know, we can make the same story with fruits and vegetable intakes and taking an antioxidant supplement or just eating fruits and vegetables. It's the same thing. There's all these moving parts in nutrition because we don't have those massive RCTs with the foods yet. And so if you want to play it safe, I think grabbing, getting your diet right is the best approach uh, for this. Food first. I like, I like your you said a little more quickly and more simply than I did. <laughs> yeah, food first always. But yeah, a, a supplement is always when we don't know exactly what's going on. It's always an extra safety measure as well. So for people, yeah, and, and have... then go on. Oh, I was going to say there are, you know, I just don't want people to interpret this. There are, you know, if if you have low iron and your doctor says you need to take a supplement, like I'm, I'm not talking about that kind of stuff or pernicious anemia and all these things, right? I'm just talking about, you know, nutrition and brain health and in, in the context of the bigger picture of where we don't know what we're doing. Of course. And especially for, for a vegan or vegetarian or plant-based diet, you know, supplementing B12 is always important because you cannot get it from, from your diet. Like you just can't get it from, from non-animal based foods. So yeah, there are, there's always a time and a place for supplements, of course. Um, what was I going to say? I can't remember now. I don't know. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> you can't read my mind. What are you talking about? No, no. Um, I haven't figured that one out. So you've talked about fish, but for people on a plant-based diet who aren't going to eat fish or maybe people want to reduce their fish intake because of the environmental impacts the heavy metals everything else that's going on there at the moment we're not 100 percent sure whether ala how much of it gets converted what's mm -hmm. going on mm -hmm. etc so is eating seeds enough like chia seeds flax seeds or should people also supplement algal oil so now i'm gonna 
if I can use this term, annoy a lot of the people listening to this, okay? Because I'm a scientist and I don't have to answer things I don't know the answer to, right? I, I don't know. People are like, but you got to tell people. I'm like, I don't have to tell people anything. I don't know the answer. Uh, if I knew the answer, I would tell you. It, you know, I recognize that people in, in the health profession sometimes have to give answers to things. I think the answer and I want to say this flat out, is I'm not 100% sure I know the answer to this question. But, if you, and if you allow me this but, in healthy adults who are uh, vegetarian or vegan, uh, we are not seeing a lot of brain issues in them in the epidemiology yet. The epidemiology is weak, though. People, you know, it's all, nutrition's all been nutrition and heart disease, nutrition and cancer, and some of these other things are just starting to come forward. So we're going to get data coming forward, but it doesn't look to me like there's a massive signal that, that vegetarians are 90-fold increased risk of Alzheimer's disease. But there's two explanations for that. And, and you know, everybody's thinking it's because, well, they can make enough DHA, so it doesn't matter. Maybe the DHA doesn't matter at all, right? So it, 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 who, that's, that's the, the more complicated thing is maybe it doesn't matter because we're wrong, right? We're just wrong and none of this stuff matters. And that's the problem with, with all the questions and being at the cutting edge of research, okay? So, um, so practically, what do you do to, to uh, you know, in case we're right, what do you do? Well, I think... Um, you know, getting the other little things uh, right is important. And, you know, lowering maybe the omega-6s, getting the other parts of your diet and eating what we think is a, a otherwise totally brain-healthy diet. And it's not just a brain-healthy diet is not just about omega-3s. There are lots of things around that. So you, if you get a few of those things right, go ahead. If you're, you know, it's like there's two types of people. I see these, I think they're called memes going on. It shows a gas tank that's almost empty in a car. And it's how do you react? And people are like, I can make it. And other people are like, oh my God, I got to fill the car up, right? So depending on how your personality is, if you're that, oh my God, I need to take the algal supplement, which is, you know, a source, go ahead and go ahead and do it. But I wouldn't do it because you're, you know, you're not doing something else right in your diet, as we said. I, I get your diet right and then go ahead and do it. I don't see a lot of harm to it if the other components of your diet are right. It's expensive. Um, and I would say there could be harm to it if you're saying, well, I'm going to do it because I'm not going to get those other things right. So, you know, the, the answer is not 100% clear to me, but we're not seeing massive signals yet. Uh you know, where I think the, the literature is first going to start to emerge is during pregnancy. Ellie, you've probably had this conversation a million times. Vegetarian diets and vegan diets can be tricky. At one place, we see people, this beautiful spread of nuts and avocados, and the pictures just make you salivate. You're like, oh, I'd like to just dive in there. At the other end, soft drinks and potato chips can be, you know, misused and, and used to represent a vegetarian and vegan diet because technically they can fit a definition, although they're junk food. So, you know, get the things right, do the other things. Exercising looks like it's good for a lot of these things. That literature suffers the same confounding issues we've got in nutrition. I think sometimes if I can poke at my exercise friends, nutrition does a little better job at confounding for it. If you read in nutrition studies, they'll check statistically if people exercise. If you read an exercise study, they won't check if they ate omega-3s. Um, there's lots of ideas about cognition and enhancing your cognitive abilities through music and language and other things. And, you know, do a bunch of these things right. And probably most importantly, and I have zero evidence for this, zero, I'm just going to speculate, stop stressing about it. Like, enjoy food. Live a little. You know, the we're, we're, even if we're right, we don't have the precision to say like you need to eat three almonds and 18 things to flaxseed and you need to do it at this time and nothing after eight o'clock at night. We have none of that. Enjoy yourself. And I suspect that the, the benefits from not being stressed out probably to some extent weigh the benefits of eating a good meal, but just running around crazy worrying about it all the time. I love that you ended on that because yeah, you're right. Stress has a huge biochemical impact on your body. Like it changes all of your nutritional requirements. 
reducing your stress levels is one of the main things I work with people to do because, you know, that's the first thing you work on. Then we work on everything else, diet and stress. Yeah, you're totally right. And I like Good. how you look at the body as a system, like you're a system of all these different factors that are all working with each other or against each other or like there's a lot of interconnecting factors. So you're right. You can't just say supplement this or not. It's it's an impossible question. You know, I've I've uh, a few years ago, I, I, I'm having my midlife crisis. I told you my age, 1975. And I was like, oh, I think I want to get into running, maybe do a triathlon, you know, something like that. And the pandemic hit and I haven't done any of this stuff. But I hired a, a running coach and I should know better than this. But I part of me was like, well, you know, if I plank longer, I should be able to run longer. And he's like, yeah, if you want to run longer, run longer, <laughs> you know, like focus on the, focus on the, the main parts of it and all these nice little things. Like if you want to do lunges, go ahead and do lunges. If you want to do more sit-ups, go ahead and do more study sit-ups, but focus on, on the core values of what, what you need to get your hand on. Right. And then, you know, spend a little bit of time, have some fun with these other things, but, uh, you know, don't get too caught up and anxious about your left hamstring or something like this. It'll it'll come. It'll come over time. I have to say I'm one of those people that takes all the precautions. So I have the genes related to like faster conversion. So I really lower my omega-3, my omega-6, not omega-3. I lower my omega-6. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm taking that plant. I'm eating the plant-based omega-3. But I also have the genes that are associated with increased risk of Alzheimer's, like potentially a great a higher turnover of omega-3 in the brain so i do supplement as well you know but i agree like sorting out the diet is more important than taking the supplement that's something that you do afterwards that's the last thing yeah and and maybe my exercise analogy wasn't that great but it's you know focus on the core values which is doing the actual exercise you're, you're going to do eating the actual diet and then these little supplements whether it's planking longer for the specific activity you're, you're looking at or taking a supplement, they're, they're like little add-ons uh, at the end. But but I think it's really important that, you know, some of this stuff we're getting from observational studies and it could have be confounded. And, you know, people eat well, exercise. People exercise, eat well. And, and these things are hard to tie out. And people, you know, go see their doctors more often than they eat well. And there's a lot of confounding factors there. And so, you know, I think if you if you step back and think about nutrition research from that perspective, you can be like, okay, well, there's a foundation here that we, we've kind of got. And the little details aren't so clear. So don't worry so much about the details. Just get the foundation right. That sounds like a, a great note to end on. Thank you so much right. for joining us today. It was a really, really cool conversation. So uh, we've heard about your research coming up. I know most of it is to do with getting the funding, but is there anything we can do to support your research going forward? Oh, you know, that's a good question. I think, I think as people just get interested in nutrition and, you know, they talk about it and they eat better, and they demand more things and um, as things get more popular then governments step up and say wait a second you know people are interested in this people have questions about this we should we should do this kind of research we should fund these kinds of things and i, th I think that would be good um you know if people are specifically interested in things they email professors or you know and, and get some information uh, we're always happy to, to try and respond to those, uh, kinds of questions. And, uh, yeah, you know, if, if you're in a position of, uh, power, uh, and you're listening to this, you know, reach out to us. We'd, we'd love to have a chat with you. And if, if you happen to be a billionaire, give me a call and we can set up a foundation and, you know, we could do some amazing things and answer some of these questions pretty quickly, I think. Okay, great. I'll, I'll be sure to let any billionaires know. <laughs> <laughs> thank you thanks Richard 